Welcome to our inventive agents and investors from across the country. Today is Thursday, August 25th, 2022, and this is All the Leads Mastermind podcast number 392. Take it away, Bruce. It's all yours. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody that has joined us live on Zoom. Um, if you are listening after the fact on YouTube or our podcast channel, um, we also welcome you guys to join us every Thursday live at one o'clock on um, on a Zoom session. You can also, if you're uh, not available to join Zoom in the future, you can also uh, find our YouTube channel. We go live there on Thursdays at one o'clock Eastern time, by the way. So if you're Pacific, it's 11, uh, 10. Um, and, uh, and, and you can join our Facebook group where we stream this live. So uh, this is a call for all of you. Um, whether you're a subscriber of all the leads or not, if you want to talk probate and real estate business, lead generation and listing uh, creation, uh, we're here for you. If you have a probate or a divorce or a pre-probate related question, uh, we're going to ask you guys to raise your hand. Uh, if you're watching on one of our live streaming, streaming platforms, please um, chat your questions in and we will take those questions um, a little bit, if you've never been here before, a little bit of a, a different format. Uh, we don't just have two talking heads sit down and have a chat about real estate. Um, we directly answer real estate related and deal related questions. Um, we field success stories in and around the probate or life transition space as well. So throw those hands up. We'll take your questions. We'll take your comments. We'll take your success stories and wins. If you are not an All The Leads subscriber, we welcome you guys to come check us out at alltheleads.com and uh, take a look at what we do. We provide leads, training, marketing platforms, websites. We provide a ton of stuff to our, uh, uh, to our subscribers to definitely make you uh, successful in the niche that you choose. Um, so uh, go check us out if, you if you're not already a subscriber or haven't checked us out before. And with that, I will uh, go ahead and get to some of the questions that you guys may have. Um, please throw your hands up. We want to hear your questions. If I don't see a hand or a comment chatted in here in a minute, um, we're just going to start uh, talking until someone gets bold and steps up. <laughs> so uh, let me go to my fellow coaches here really quickly. Chuck, um, do you have anything? And you, Chuck, you are on mute. For some reason, sound isn't coming through. Well, we're figuring that out. Tim or Jim, do you guys have anything? Jim? Yep. Can you hear me now? Uh, we got Chuck now. And everybody seems to be on mute. I could see Tim's mouth moving, too. So all kinds of people were trying to talk. And there wasn't any sound coming in anywhere. So Chuck, Chuck first. Yep. So thank you. Um, Yesterday, I had a call from one of our advanced coaching students, and they were, well, actually, it was it was two days ago, they called me in preparation because they did make a contact with a prospect, and they were having a conversation that the personal representative was open to hearing their particular services, and you know, they actually were able to set an appointment, even though the personal representative was able, had already committed to another agent verbally, right? I'm gonna list my house with you verbally. He went in there yesterday. Uh, we did a, a, a quick coaching session in advance of it, you know, kind of clarified some of how do I approach this? We were able to uncover, you know, basically go in and offer the services just like we just like we talked. He's already built out his team. He won the listing. He got the listing agreement signed. He had an answer for every single one of their particular questions. They were very impressed. And, you know, he called me afterwards. He was just he was just thrilled because it was a nine hundred thousand dollar listing and they have another five hundred thousand dollar house to sell. And they have a business that deals in land and they are initiating that relationship. So just because a personal representative says that. I've already committed to someone else. Don't give up, you know, as long as they haven't signed the listing agreement, right? If they have signed, then stop. If they haven't signed, continue to uh, set the appointment and offer the services because I think what, what we teach here at All The Leads and how to approach, 
really gives people the benefit. It brings value to the, the situation and the transaction to help them do it easier than themselves. A couple of good techniques to use if you guys ever do run into that and just don't know what to do. Um, what one would be um, an appeal to their open or closed mindedness. Uh, nobody likes to be considered as a closed minded individual. And so, uh, hey, you know what, we've already uh, picked our agent. Hey, would you be open to seeing a different plan if it could help um, get the family more money? Uh, would you be open to? And I don't always, sometimes I'll say, would you be open minded to? Um, sometimes I leave the minded out. Would you be open to? And a lot of people would, uh, would at least consider doing that if, so you can't just say, would you be open to seeing what I do? You, you need to be able to say, would you be open to a new plan if it could blank? Okay, if it could, you, you fill in the blank with whatever your claim is or whatever your uh, proposition is. Another way is, hey, have you, are you fully committed to doing that without looking at any other options? So are you fully committed to doing that without looking at any other options? Sometimes the answer is yes, but a lot of times people will turn around and say, no, you know what, I, I, would, I would be open to looking at other options. Now your foot's in the door. Now you can do exactly what our coaching client, the Chuck Privately Coaches, um, has done. Um, so that's <laughs> that's an amazing story. I uh, I wish uh, that individual was on here and could share the story and uh, get uh, be in line for win of the week. That'd be that'd be pretty amazing. Yeah, they're busy working on getting a listing set up. Okay, well, that means that uh, win of the week is still open. Um, if you do have a success story or a win share it. Um, we do give a, a discount on next month of leads for anyone who does have the win of the week. So if you if you guys have had a win or a success, uh, raise that hand and share it. Um, you'll be in line for win of the week. And uh, at least you don't have to compete with that one because that, uh, that gentleman is not here today. Um, now, before I move to other coaches' comments. Uh, we do have a question on uh, social media. So coming through our live Facebook stream, um, stream uh, Sheila has asked, what's the best way to approach a lead whom you haven't had contact or you have had contact with before, but not for the last three months? What would be a good opening line? This is, this is a great question. And it's not only great because you're gonna deal with it with your leads, probate leads or different types of leads, but it's also a great question because I get it a lot when um, agents specifically, so this could be, the question could be agent or investor, but a lot of agents ask this question with their sphere of influence. Hey, I had a past client. I haven't spoken with them since the closing three years ago. How do I initiate that relationship? Hey, I have a lead. I really dropped the ball. I haven't talked to them in four months. It's kind of awkward and I'm embarrassed to call them now. How do I open that relationship? I think we've all been there. I've been there about 200 times in my business. Okay, so how do you open it? You just call and say, hey, you know, it's been a little while since we chatted. Um, I'm going to say, this is Bruce Hill. Do you happen to remember our talk a couple of months ago? No? Okay, do you mind if I give you a quick recap of what I told you a few months ago? Or, yeah, I remember. Well, hey, you know, I'm sorry it took me a little bit to get back to you, but I just wanted, you told me blank a few months ago. I just wanted to see if that was still the case. Okay, and get them talking. At this point, the hard part is over. Now they should start to give you some interaction. So really, really easy conversation. Hey, I'm not sure if you remember me. We spoke a few months ago. Uh, do you remember? If the answer is no, move into your pitch. Well, here's kind of what I, I do, okay? If the answer is yes, which it probably is, I'm sorry, it took me a little bit to, to circle back to you. You told me this, just wanted to make sure that that was still the case. Has anything changed in your situation? Has anything changed in your life? And get them talking. Um, that's as uh, simple as I can make it, but it, it really shouldn't be any more complicated than that. Do any coaches or subscribers or uh, agents, investors on here have a different way that you would approach that we'd like to hear. The only, only thing I would add is that I have in, in the past used the approach of saying, I haven't heard from you in a while. I expected to hear from you kind of before now, so I thought I'd check in, are you okay? Basically make it a 
you know, turn, turn it around on them just a little bit. Make it their fault. You, yeah, you haven't necessarily called them, but, uh, you know, I always try to also leave a phone call where I didn't succeed in my initial objective with a comment that says, hey, well, you know, if something comes up or if you make a decision or if anything happens at all, you got any questions, please reach out and let me know. I'm going to maintain interest in what's going on here. That gives you the ability to say that without fear coming back because I didn't hear from you and that's why I'm checking back with you. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Thank you, Tim. Um, folks, uh, no other chats or hands uh, raised at this point. Um, I see a lot of uh, blank Zoom squares with names only. Uh, I'm not going to let that stand. If you're not on camera and you're camera ready, throw those cameras on. We want to have some interaction here today. Uh, this is uh, your call. So if you want to get value out of, out of this session, uh, pop those questions in. It uh, doesn't matter how a basic or advanced the question is. It doesn't matter if you feel like everyone else already knows. I promise you, most of your questions, even if you feel like it's basic, um, half of the room is probably going to have the same question. So uh, pop your hands up. Let's let's hear from some of you guys. Um, uh, Sheila says, I'm such a smooth <laughs> talker, it's a smooth communicator. Uh, this this stuff is um, it takes practice. Someone asked me yesterday. They said, uh, "If you could go back to the beginning of your career, career and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be?" And I've never offered this advice before. It just hit me in the spur of the moment, and I said, um, "I said uh, my advice would be to go out and make mistakes. Mistakes are the greatest teacher." in life, the greatest teacher in business. And if you're afraid of making mistakes, you are afraid of growth. So the best mistake to learn from is someone else's mistake. The second best to make uh, the, uh, the second uh, best mistake to learn from is your mistake. If you're not making mistakes, you're not growing. So I'm going to challenge everyone to go out there and do what's uncomfortable and make mistakes. And just because you make one, don't let it steer you away from trying again. You will learn, you will grow. And when with Sheila saying I'm a smooth communicator, it's not because I've always been a smooth communicator. I have not. Um, some people would disagree with Sheila. <laughs> Sometimes I'm a terrible communicator. But anything that I do that's good is because I've screwed up many, 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 many times and I've been willing to learn and adjust from those mistakes. So with that said, I do see a couple of hands. Let's go to White Simpson here real quick. Uh, White, um, if you can unmute yourself, I think I have to give you permission. There you go, White. Um, you should be able to unmute now. Hey, guys. How y'all doing? Um, Bruce, I talked to one of those uh, you know, after we talked yesterday afternoon. I called this morning, and I got a executor, or I got to the PR, and he had a situation where there's four, there's five siblings, and one, this he's executor, loan executor, and the sister living in the house has he thinks has forged a deed, putting the house in her name. He does. She he has an attorney that that he did after the filing. Um, but I, I don't know if that attorney, I think all they do is probate. So I, mm -hmm. I don't know if, if that would fall within that or if he needs somebody that's got more experience. I told him I'd find out and get back with him. Is there a second deed or is the deed that he believes is forged? Is it the only deed that is available? Anywhere? It, well, it was done after his mother's death. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I I would does it uh, have her signature on it. He doesn't. It does, but he thinks it was forged. It was not. He doesn't think it is her. He's one hundred percent sure it's not her signature. <laughs> but it, it, she tried to forge it uh, because, and he did talk to his attorney, but there's no will, and he and that's why they said it's not cut and dry. Uh, but it's for for the siblings against one. Um, this, may be, this may be too obvious, but it was is the date on the deed 
before her death? I don't <laughs> think I don't think so. I mean, because if somebody forged or say if somebody signed something and dated it after she was dead, there's a you may have a pretty good case there. Well, so typically deeds, and this is going to vary from state to state, but the majority of states do not have a date on the deed itself. Um, and, it, and it really does vary. I've, I've seen deeds in, in multiple states. I've seen some with a date on the deed. Um, there is a date on the notary. Right. And so sometimes someone could sign a deed, not put a date on it, and then it could get notarized later. I've seen multiple cases where a deed was passed from one individual to the other. And, uh, and, and the person that was receiving that deed didn't go to record it. So it's possible that that's the case. Um, it's unlikely, but it's possible. So White, when you say it's four against one, is it four people fighting the brother that you're in communication with? Or is it four people saying, hey, this deed is not valid? It's four saying the deed is not valid. Okay. All right. Um, get yourself a real estate litigator involved. Um, okay. Not a probate attorney. Get yourself a real estate litigator involved. Have a preliminary conversation with the um, in, in the, in the PR, the individual that you're talking with, and maybe the other family members. Just a quick uh, run through with a um, not just any litigator. It really needs to be someone in real estate. And, okay. uh, yeah. and uh, just see if you have a case. It sounds to me like you would. Okay. And I would recommend uh -huh. you do it really quickly, only because if if he is banding that deed about. Uh, he could attempt to sell it, close it, and get out of it unless somebody challenges it. You need to get somebody to put a stop order on any transfer at this point while it's being considered, and they need time is of the essence. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, White. Good question. I uh, wish it was. Uh, I wish it was a better situation, but good question. Yeah. All right. Uh, before we go to Dan, uh, Scott. Uh, Scott said, hey, I need, he chatted in, I need to make more mistakes. Um, and I am not going to let that, uh, let that sit, Scott, go make some mistakes and let me know what they are. So <laughs> let's go to, uh, go to Dan here real quick. Dan, what do you have for us? I'll ask you to unmute yourself. Okay. Hi guys. Um, so I'm over in Chicago. Um, I am starting to call uh, on some of these probate leads. What I what I what I'm observing is uh, uh, I did get a hold of some PRs uh, and they're telling me that yeah we got everything handled uh, it's uh, we have a probate attorney um, he's got it I you know I, I I kind of ask is there real estate involved yeah it's we're uh, you know we, we I think we have it sold you know I and and I had a couple of conversations that kind of went that that way. Um, so what is it that, what is it that you think I can do at this point with these prospects? Yep. I want you to go back and, um, uh, after the fact, and I'll, I'll repeat this, but re-listen to the beginning of the call with Chuck's success story is, um, Hey, I completely get it. Congratulations. Um, uh, just so I know, are you close to seeing if someone else can get you a better deal? Are you closed? Are you closed minded? Or are you closed off to seeing if, if someone else might be able to get you a better deal on that sale? So appeal to their uh, perception of themselves that they're open minded. And I can tell you that um, in my opinion, 60, 70 percent of individuals in this walking around on this earth are pretty closed minded individuals, if not more, if not more. None of us think that we're closed-minded. So the second a question is asked that challenges your open-mindedness, you're immediately going to open up a little bit because we don't want to think that we're closed off like we really are. Um, so I would um, challenge uh, challenge them that way with a simple question. I wouldn't say, hey, I'm going to challenge you right now. You haven't earned that right in their mind. You need reform. <laughs> But I would uh, I would challenge them with the question: Are you open to seeing if if you might be able to get a better deal? Or are you closed off to seeing if there's a better deal to be had if somebody else had a different plan? Um, get there. No, I'm not closed. Okay. Would would there be 15 minutes that uh, that I could meet you and run through my plan, see if there's something that I could do better than you have on the table right now? So I'm coming at it from the uh, from the perspective of. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in buying the property. I'm a, I'm a direct buyer. Mm -hmm. So yep. I would be interested in purchasing their property. 
I'm not particularly interested in in getting their property listed. I mean, I do have uh, real estate brokers that that I work with. Uh, they they wouldn't mind a listing, but that's kind of from from this side. Um, so, if if let's say if there are uh, if it's a retail sale, I probably how would I go about you know would I even kind of jump in, into the conversation of what, what about the condition of the property? Uh, would I would I talk about uh, you know uh, if the property needs work? You know things like that. Um, because generally, what, what my my objective would be to set up an appointment, and I know we shouldn't call it an appointment. We should call it something informal, like uh, I'm going to drive by and take a look at it. Do you mind meeting me there so we can yep. I can come and see interior pictures and see if it's something that's gonna uh, that's gonna be a fit for, uh, mm -hmm. for 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 me to move forward. If at all possible, everyone needs to be have some pre uh, pre appointment questions that they're asking uh, every everyone if possible there are times when you've got someone that's in a rush they quickly agree, agree to an appointment or a meeting and you don't have time to ask those questions so um, what i'm going to do in a case like this dan is i'm going to say uh, so let's let's pretend that they um, that they're open and they're communicating back and forth with you i'm just going to say hey tell me a little bit more about uh, what you are looking for when you sell the property. Are you looking for um, retail value in exchange for a repaired house? Or are you looking to uh, unload it quickly and not do any more work? Which one's better for you? Hey, I want retail. Okay, perfect. Still, you, you Dan, are still going to take that appointment, that meeting. You just know which angle you're going to be presenting to. And in a case like that, I would probably bring one of my uh, real, realtor partners in on that meeting. I would, um, I would get some comps together on that. I would have my price in mind. And then that way, when uh, you go and present the options, you are still presenting your I'll buy it cash as is price, just with the understanding that they're probably going to go toward that second option. And at least then you've worked out a referral and you've built a stronger relationship with your realtor partner. Okay. okay. Uh, what, what about uh, uh, if, you know, there's, there's always a, a, there's a disconnect between people w wanting a retail price on a house that, that is not re really retail ready. Yep. They don't have realistic expectations. So what I'll do in a case like that is I'll, I'll still present two to three different options and the retail option will, um, will have a range. So low range, high range. And then I'll say, but if you want to push for this, higher, this retail range, I don't say if you wanna push for the highest price, I say, if you wanna push for this retail range, page mm -hmm. number two has a list, we're gonna create a list of the things that you need to do, not with how much they're gonna cost, Leave that up to their imagination, a right, list of right. things that they need to do to get it ready for retail. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to say, you need to paint the rooms, you need to get rid of the popcorn ceilings, you need to upgrade the furnace, you need to change two windows. So I'm just going to list off the things that, that I would do if I was making it ready for max value and then say, uh, do you, do you want to go for retail or would you like to go the as is route? Maybe they say retail. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. You have contractors for me. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll connect you with some contractors. You can get ready for retail, but let their imagination run wild. Most of the time, I guess with prices, with, uh, with repair prices and construction prices going crazy, maybe they're, they're not high anymore, but most people overestimate how much repairs are going to cost. At least they used to. Let them think that the repairs you're proposing are going to cost $40,000 when they're going to be 10 or 15. Don't lie to them and tell them that they're going to cost 40, but let, their, let them imagine how much those repairs are going to cost sure. and then select into which option they want to go with. Uh, so you would, you would, uh, you, your thought is to connect them to my contractors. I mean, my contractors are busy uh, or, or do I just connect them to some retail contractors who, who have uh, six months of 
um, projects already lined up and they need to wait for six months. Sure. Uh, you yeah. know, that, that would be, that would likely be, you know, there's contractors that I use mm -hmm. and they, they do my projects and, you know, I get fair price. Uh, and then there's contractors that get, they give retail prices. A part of your team needs to be enough contractors to be able to um, give them options. So if your contractors are six months out, um, then I'd have another couple of backup contractors say, here's three general contractors I use, here's three painters I use, here's three electricians I use, and so on, and let them call. And if they run into a bunch of people that are six months out, then they might call you back and go, yeah, you know what? Um, I, I don't I don't think we've got the time to deal with this. What would you buy that? You said you'd buy the house for 200, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, if they want retail and they're going to do some work, just give them some connections. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. So it could be somebody from uh, Angie's list. Right? Sure. I wouldn't pass a name along if I hadn't vetted the person at least a little bit. Okay. Not some good social proof on the individual. I wouldn't go on Facebook and say, hey, who's a good HVAC tech? And Billy Bob chimes in and says, hey, I fix air conditioners. I wouldn't pass that name along because there's no social proof there. But I would right. I would connect them with uh, with someone. If he, I'd say even if you haven't used them, preferably you've used them. But, but honestly, you got your guys. So um, if it's a few people you haven't used, but at least you know that they've got some good reviews and they've been in it for a little bit, you can connect them there as well. Okay. Any okay. other, any, any coaches, you guys, I'm monopolizing the answer here. You guys yeah, I was just gonna, Dan, I was gonna, you are not a realtor, correct? I think you said you had realtors you could refer to. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a real estate broker, no. Okay, the only, the only thing I was gonna, you know, given you try everything Bruce meant, uh, you know, mentioned that it doesn't work. Uh, I was both a realtor and an investor. And I was, if, if somebody has an unrealistic expectation, if they want retail or above retail, but they want a quick sale, don't, don't be afraid to refer it to a realtor. I, ha I can't tell you how many cases that I had where I really wanted to buy it, but I went ahead and listed it. And I even told them, their price was unrealistic and I listed it at an unrealistic price. And then two, three, four months later, when they got the, their urgency factor increased or they got more realistic, I was the first in line, you know, to buy it. So it, it, before you completely throw the lead, lead away, don't be reluctant to refer it to a realtor that'll ensure that you're the first investor in line if the situation changes. You follow me? Because I, I follow you exactly. So my, yeah. my, 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 I have a follow up question on that is, sure. uh, so does it make sense to get a real to, uh, to get a broker's license? Uh, or uh, yes, it's uh, uh, because what, I, what, I, what I'm what I'm getting at is, it, it, it appears that 80% of the properties are going to be roughly uh, brokered, and about 20% of the properties are going to be sold as it directly. Right. So you want to collect the broker's commission and be able to uh, benefit in, in that route uh, just as much as just buying the property uh, in, into the you know own por portfolio. And I that brings up another point because you know not only do you have the opportunity to you could list it yourself and you can add value to the transaction in that way, or you can refer it out and get twenty five percent. So you don't have to necessarily you know, give up your in your investor focus and your investor lifestyle to add on handling, you know, retail transactions as a real estate broker, you can, you know, still monetize those opportunities by sending out a referral. Yeah, I mean, and, and I already reached out to, uh, uh, to a couple of brokers that I know, and they can list the property. It's just that, um, you know, it's uh, it's a new venue for me as far as uh, probates. I, I I understand it, it does have potential, obviously. So it's uh, but you do need to set up the right people and in, in the right places. You know, you need you need brokers that that are hungry enough to go after the business, and uh, uh, and want want to service that part of it. And you also need to uh, uh, to be able to get um, um, to be on the preferred list with you know, wh whoever 
the whoever the property is listed with. So yep, get your license. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Even if that's not going to be your main focus, even if even even if it's still going to be investing, and I'll tell you, um, eighty twenty, if left to their own um, devices with no um, appropriately or appropriate and ethical influence. So you want to be ethical, but without um, a good salesperson who's ethically influencing them, they would probably fall 80% listing, 20% sell direct. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get that down to 50-50 with skill. So you can, you can make it to where it's 50% 50, 50 go um, a direct sale versus listing um, with the appropriate skill, as long as you're still being ethical and you're not talking someone into hurting themselves. Oh no, you're never going to get 500,000 for this when you know good and well that they would. All right. But, uh, but you can still present, present the, uh, the options in a way that they go, you know, I wasn't thinking about all the work that was going to go into this listing. Now uh, I think Jim, Chuck and I, we all have a real estate agent background. So uh, we're going to generally lean toward teaching people how to list, but I, I don't want you to think that only 20% of these leads are going to go straight to an investor. It could be a lot higher than that with the right skill on your end. Right. And, and, and I, I recognize that that's why I'm trying to uh, gain that skill as, as quickly as possible. <laughs> awesome. All right. Um, I appreciate it, Dan. Thank you. Um, Sharon, Sharon uh, chatted in uh, that uh, for white, that there will be a notary stamp on the deed. Um, I, uh, by the way, I have seen deeds that didn't have a notary stamp because they were signed privately just between two parties that knew each other. But there really should be a notary stamp on each deed. Um, you should, if there is a stamp, you should inquire with that notary um, to gain the proof that you need. Um, notaries, if, they're, if they care about that license at all, that certification at all, and that stamp at all, uh, they're not going to lie. Uh, maybe they don't care about it, but you should... Uh, ask for a copy of the deed and uh, see if you can track down the notary that stamped it. Since you brought White's deal up again, I just need to ask a quick question and I should have asked it then and maybe I missed it, but uh, is there a PR appointed on this deal? White. Yes, we got to ask you to unmute again to do this, huh? There you go. Go ahead. Yes, there is a a PR appointed. It's the gentleman I talked to, and he did have to put up a. Uh, the judge did require him to put up a ten percent bond. And is he the one who has the the fake deed, or is it one of the others? It's his sister that's living in the house. Uh, that was <laughs> oh. living. That was living with his mother. Uh, so she's there. She's in the house. She's in the house. And he, I mean, he basically told me he didn't have any idea of what he was doing. Um, he's kind of lost. Okay, um, well, so. that's good. And that's why I asked, because if he's the PR, he has the standing to do all of the things that, that we talked about before. And it, as an individual, he would be doing it basically to, even though there's not a will, it's a contest of what's going on. But if he's mm -hmm. the personal representative, it's his responsibility to do it because if he feels like there's a fake deed or I mean a, a fake yes, signature, right. he's violating the law and, and he's going to forfeit his bond if they can't clear title on it. So okay. he's got a lot of reasons to go do that. And that's what you want to shake him up with. That, that's a okay. lot more data. All right. I will do that today. Thank you, sir. All right, bud. Thank you. So I'm going to go to Anthony John. Um, so uh, let's go, Anthony. John, you're third in line, but your hand went down a little bit ago, and, and, and so I'm going to come to you right after Anthony, and then is it um, uh, Cabby? Is that right? Got it. Okay. Uh, so, Anthony, if you would unmute yourself, please. Share away. Hey, how are you? Um, so, I'm pretty much a brand new wholesaler in northern New Jersey. Um, so far, haven't touched probates. We just got a high equity list. Um, I've heard about the company before. Um, just had a couple of questions because I watched a podcast. One of these uh, famous wholesale YouTubers, he was uh, raving about the company. And 
I believe what he said was that you guys for the probate leads, um, like they're a little, like when the county gets them, does it take a while for you guys to get the lead? Um, I'll let Tim answer most of that question in short. My my short answer, because uh, Tim just disappeared on my screen, is oh okay okay Tim go ahead and answer. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where I went either. I saw I, I'm over there somewhere. Um, so we we are at it every month. We literally uh, process the leads on a monthly basis, and so everything within a 30 day period you get. So. If our date of delivery of the leads is tomorrow, then everything through the end of you know yesterday you'll get, and it's that kind of a window. That's pretty much it. So it's a thirty-day slice of everything that got filed in that county over the last thirty days. Yep. So it's feasible that something could be about three weeks back, depending on the county. By the way, we've got a couple of counties that deliver biweekly. Uh, not many. A lot of that depends on what access the county allows us so yeah yeah that was kind of a part two to my question was um does it depend on county do you guys get all the, all the leads or I, I know the company's called all the leads but do you guys get all the probate leads um or so or some counties may be tougher maybe they only give you a limited amount we get them all our our, our job is to collect them all because it's done Hence on the a subscription basis so our 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 commitment of services that we'll get you everything that we can get you and the counties don't hold back on it sometimes the challenge is that there are and it's becoming less and less the case there are counties and were counties during covid that gave us limited access and so our numbers that we were able to provide went way down because there are certain things you have to go through at the courthouse to get it if we have to physically go there to do it uh oftentimes we were only able to get five in a day and all that, that's all kind of changed now and kind of back to normal in terms of what we can do in terms of courthouse access. So yeah, we get them all. Okay, gotcha. And um, as I said, I've never touched probate list, but uh, I'm assuming this is these are kind of deals that don't happen um, maybe as quickly as other types of deals. So does the three, you know, the, the 30 day like lag in getting a leads really affect, um, you know, deal like, uh, closings and stuff or is it pretty much like you're good to go even if it's on a 30-day delay a really small percentage of the leads move lightning fast very small the people that move insanely fast normally have their buyer or their agent picked out long before the loss and before filing probate so occasionally you get someone and they're like oh, i just listed the house yesterday or just sold the house yesterday it's it's a very, very small percentage. And uh, and I've found that most of those people knew exactly what they were going to do and who they were going to sell it to months before opening probate. So I would say that uh, you usually weren't going to get those. The vast majority of these folks are in a four to eight month window. Um, they've got a ton of paperwork, um, a ton of accounting, a lot of cleanup to do. Uh, most of the time they haven't even thought about or talked about um, whether they're going to sell with the family. Um, so that usually comes later. And we find that those initial calls are, are often getting people that are like, hey, I don't know what I'm going to do yet. Um, I, I think I'd like to sell the house, but I don't even know if my brothers would agree. Um, and so you're, you're there to establish rapport and kind of uh, work that lead for the next couple of months while you're, you're moving them to the place where they're ready to emotionally deal with it. So four to eight month window is, is pretty normal. And you're oftentimes the catalyst for getting it started because it's your phone call. If, if you get that response back from them and they say, well, we're not really sure what we're going to go do and all that. Well, have you done anything yet? And, you know, you can start the process there. And as long as you know the things that they're going to need to do, given the market that you're in, you should know those pretty well. And as you know those things, you can step by step kind of walk them through some of the pieces there. You have the opportunity then to establish yourself as, yourself as an expert. The only other thing I'd add about timing is this, that it is very, very true that it does not, it's not necessary for a probate to be filed within X days of a person's death. Sometimes it, it, it can be six months after the person died before they ever get around to filing probate. 
a lot of that has to do with emotion. It's also, you know, there's not uh, somebody's living in the house and there's no quick movement to get that done or the person who's living in the house is fine and all of a sudden they're not fine. It often happens in terms of an older spouse who stays in the home and then six, six months after the other spouse passes away, uh, you know, they have a health problem or they need to get moved somewhere else. And those are the things that move it forward. So mm -hmm. they season extremely well. Yep. I, I got you. Um, um, go ahead, Bruce. Well, I, um, your follow-up question then, then um, Jim, I'm going to say something really, really fast. Uh, we, I, I had someone ask me a few days ago, they said, I just got this lead. It says that the person passed away three years ago. Is this fake? And, uh, and so one of the things that you do when you're looking through probates is if you do see the death date was years ago, get with them fast. A lot of times the reason that they open probate is because they tried to sell the house and they realized that they hadn't gone through the appropriate steps. And so all of a sudden that delay was due to ignorance on their part. They didn't even know what probate was. So if you see a probate lead that has a, a date of death from years ago, uh, they are like, you, you better move pretty quickly because they're probably trying to sell something that they can't legally sell. And I think that brings up a, that brings up a big point um, that as you're marketing to additional lists, I mean, it could be pre-foreclosure, could be code violations, could be a number of associated lists that you're going to be you know, targeting as a wholesaler, you may actually fall into some situations, just as Bruce described, where they there is a need to file probate, where they haven't done that already. And it's been quite some time. I've seen them as I've seen them over 20 years beyond the, the date of death. So people just don't know specifically in the in the process of, of closing things, you know, of, of or, I'm sorry, of someone passing away. The family may not be aware of what particular situations and there can be other title issues where you've got to do additional probates you know in order to be able to settle and and sell the one that uh you have on your plate so yeah yeah okay I, I guess i would ask um since i'm definitely not an expert at all in uh probates i got a lot of research to do on that in my area what is the what kind of team do i need to establish who do i need on my team probate attorneys you know, what, what are the main uh, people I need on my team? Uh, multiple probate attorneys, don't limit yourself. Um, multiple financial advisors. And I say multiple because your financial advisors are going to be the ones that have relationships with the attorneys. If you cold call an attorney, they might give you the time of day, they might not. But if you are introduced by their trusted referral partner, they're going to give you the time of day. So um, go to financial advisors. Get people who can help invest inherited wealth, probate and estate planning attorneys. Uh, beyond that, um, write down general uh, contractors, and then uh, there's going to be multiple subcategories under there. You want to have a handful of, of contractors with different areas of specialty, handyman, um, insurance agent, PNC insurance agent. What kind hey, of insurance gonna... agent? Uh, property and casualty. Go ahead, uh, Tim you're going to run out of time here. And what I was going to suggest is the best advice that I think we could give you is you need to be in, in our probate foundation class. Uh, Bruce, why don't you talk about that real quickly and let, cause we've got several other people to chat with. They're going to run out of time. Gotcha. Uh, a week and a half. Um, everyone needs to be in probate foundations, whether you're a subscriber of all the leads or not take probate foundations. It's every month on the first Wednesday of the month at two o'clock Eastern time, 11 Pacific. You can register for that for free on um, uh, alltheleads.com. If you're a subscriber, just log in. Um, if you're not a subscriber, still just go to alltheleads.com, click on training, and you can register for foundations. Um, so that team is just uh, just those. Uh, here's the thing, Anthony. You, you said something real that I have to touch on. Um, you said you have a lot of research to do. You do not have to be a probate expert. That's what the attorneys are for. You need to know how to offer a solution that that picks up where the attorney leaves off. So they're handling the accounting and the uh, the legal elements of it. Uh, the families are still dealing with property cleanouts, estate sales. So write those two things down: property cleanout, estate sales. They're still dealing with switching insurances. They're still dealing with investing their money. Um, 
And, uh, and then uh, they got to cut the grass. <laughs> they got to just take care of everything around a house. So when you're building your team, just think of what someone have to do over at a house that they've inherited if they're not going to sell it for five months. Mm-hmm. And if, if there's something that they have to do, that's a, that's a team member that you should put on your team. I got you. All right. Perfect. And lastly, Nat, uh, Anthony, I was going to tell you, one of our account reps, uh, Natalie, is on the call. She had messaged me. She offered right after the call, if you like, she'll reach out to you and, you know, answer any more immediate questions you have. And uh, she can give you specifics on any counties you're interested in. She did do a quick check. You're in our system, but we don't have a phone number for you. So, so if you do, if you would like her to call, just uh, send an email to natalie at allvaleeds.com. Uh, and as soon as the call is over, she'll reach out to you and answer all the rest of your questions. Natalie at all the leads.com. All right, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Anthony. Um, And John, if we could uh, come to you next and Cabby, you're right after that. Um, I'm not trying to jump John in front of the line, but his hand went down. um, And I I don't know if it was a system glitch. So I'm going to go to the person that had their hand up at the beginning of the call. John, go ahead. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, Back to your, that deed about the debt, the sister living in the house. So go get yourself a good system like data tree or talk to your title company about getting data tree, pull the deed, get a copy of it, see when the person passed away and see when that deed was signed. Um, if it's after the passing of the person, it's a fraudulent deed. It's there's no value in that deed at all. If you go to a title company, that deed just going to get thrown out. Right. Mm-hmm. And also I've had this happen before the nephew went in, did the same thing, signed the got, you know, fraudulently found a fake notary, all that kind of stuff. They, they took it straight to the probate court. The probate court went in there, ruled that it's fraudulent, all that kind of stuff. And then just get that deed just gets pretty much wiped out of the of the chain of history of all the deeds. So but having a good system like data tree, I pull deeds constantly, constantly. What if lead comes in, I'm pulling deeds, I'm pulling property profiles. Who's on the deed? Is it do we have uninsured deeds out in California? If you have an uninsured deed, it has to be cleared, period. Um, we have to go through a title company or an attorney, right? If they're, if they're just a deed from a private party, you're going to have to have affidavits signed saying that there's no interest. They won't even touch it. Title companies out here. So um, just be mindful of that, that if there is insured deeds, you got to be checked that stuff too. Good uh, advice. Data tree. Or right? your property history. There might be a, I've had stuff show up from 1978 from a divorce that we had to go get cleared. So just do your research on these property. It helps the client out too. The attorneys are out there doing the best they can, but you're the real estate expert. You got to be making sure this property is sellable um, in that transaction. So, yeah, I would say that, that John, you're spot on. One of your most important team members is going to be a solid title company. Oh yeah. I pull deeds for attorneys constantly. They're doing trusts. They ask me for their deed, right? Because the title companies don't want to work with them because they're not directing business back to them, right? My title rep said he just shut off a hundred attorneys from their data tree stuff because they were not directing business back. Then he directs them back to me. Hey, John can get you deeds, right? He can get you deeds. If you, if you work with us and work as a team together, we can get you the deeds. So I pulled deeds for, I probably pulled 10 a day, honestly, for my attorneys. I build nice. relationships with them. Um, and then also I have them coming to me. Hey, I got this new probate case. Who's on title? What's the value? Is there equity in it? What are the, when were the last loans put on it? They're asking me for that help because it's too much effort and time for their paralegals, you know, hundred an hour for their paralegal to do it versus me doing it. It's part of my service to my, my attorneys. And I do data death values, all that kind of stuff for these people. So. That's a super way to build a solid relationship with an attorney. How many do you get? Do you get deals referred to you from those attorneys? Yeah. 87% of my business is all referral from attorneys, fiduciaries, stuff like that. So, and I do the, the, you got a door knock, you got to get in their door first, right? You got to build a relationship first and then they start calling you for help. So, um, I also market to these. I just, this marketing too helps out, but the building the relationship plus like uh, one of the kids, one, someone was saying, I think it was Dan says, um, how can we help you? Right. Who's the attorney on who, who are you working with on the attorney? You might know them. 
then I reach out to the attorney. Hey, you have this case going on. I, I talked to the client, you know, how can we help you out? It just, it's just massive circle. The business isn't really that big. There are not that many attorneys out there. So anyway. it, it isn't. And it's, it's pretty simple. What you just described, it does take some effort to get in. And just cause you're not making any headway in two months or three months doesn't mean anything. That fifth month might be where it, the relationship it takes about six from. months to get into an attorney from an office, you're door knocking them, you're emailing them, you're meeting the paralegal up front or the receptionist. I drop stuff off constantly. I try to door knock them once a quarter. Um, I go and pull their emails. I try to find them on Facebook, everything you can just to beat them up. But yeah, it takes six months at least to hey, just John, get you known, might... right? Just get known. And then probably a yeah. couple more months just to get that trust built. So it's John, a long you might want to hop off of Facebook and hop into LinkedIn. Oh, that too. No, I got LinkedIn, yeah. Instagram, Facebook, right? Wherever you can beat them up at, right? And then it becomes easy. Once you've well, got the relationship, just don't screw it up at that easy point. Easy is I, because I wants to constantly build, right? So I have a list of 180. And so out of the 180, I got about 40 good top A clients, right? So it's a just this stack in pennies is my insurance guy would say. So that's nice. Uh, that's awesome. John, thank yep. you so much. Really appreciate it. Anything else we can answer for you or help you with? No, I'm here yeah. just picking up the tidbits. So that's great advice, man. Uh, outstanding advice. Appreciate so, you. Yeah. Thanks, man. Uh, Cabby, let's go to you here. We've got about five minutes before the top of the hour. Um, what can we help you with? Okay. So um, I'm, I'm going to start, I guess, using your program in September. Um, I'm just making a schedule as far as, um, you know, how to go about doing a direct mail, um, you know, using your system. I, I think they pulled the county and they said it was about 200 a month, I guess, is, is how much, uh, how many listings I get. Um, so if it's 200 a month, and from what I understand with direct mail, um, you shouldn't stop mailing, right? So does that mean then I'll be basically mailing, you know, so the schedule that I have is I'll mail 200 the first month and then the second month, then I'm going to be mailing around 400, right? The 200 from the previous month and then the 200 from that month. So, and so on. Is that how you guys recommend the schedule to, to, to pan out? Mostly. Now, every market is different. And so you're going to have some markets where it makes sense to go every two weeks for a couple of months. And then maybe you take a little bit of a break and, and go uh, monthly during month five, six, seven. Okay, uh, the, every market's different. My, my point in using that example is not to confuse anyone. It's to say that you need to be on a coaching session, which is free for our subscribers to kind of discuss what your market may look like and uh, what sort of a good strategy is gonna be but let's just hypothetically say that you never scrub a single lead out of the system. And Tim, I'll get you in just a second. Let's say you, you never scrub a lead out. You never talk to anyone and hear, hey, we already sold. We don't have real estate or yes, we're going to sell. And so everybody just keeps getting mail from you because you've never had a single conversation. That, that would mean that, uh, that 200 on month one, 400 on month two, 600 on month three, 800, 1,000 and so on. So it does build up. But the truth is, is you're going to be having conversations and you're going to get someone that says, yes, I'm going to sell. Let's set an appointment up in a month. And you're going to go and scrub them out of your mailer mailing campaign because the last thing you want is for them to get a letter from you saying, hey, I know we've never talked. My name is Cabby and this is what I do because you already had that conversation. And you're going to have people that say, I don't have a house. I'm never going to sell. Take them out. Um, so the truth is it doesn't build the, quite the way that you described. Uh, every month, you're probably going to peel a, a, a 10% off of that original list. Okay. And so now you've only got 180 to mail and the next month, only 150 to mail and so on. Okay. So, yep. Okay. And that all de it, it all depends on how aggressive you are on your follow-up calls, because the whole premise is to mail the letter. And as soon as the letter goes out, you receive a copy of the letter as well. We mail it back to you so you get it and as soon as you get it that's when your calls need to start okay. and if you call aggressively 
that's how you get that lift scrub down. You're going to know what's going on there. And uh, that's the whole point about doing it. Otherwise, you would be doing, you know, you'd be stacking them up. But each time you're doing diminishing, diminishing numbers as you scrub your lift down. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, yeah, I think that was one of my main things. Um, and then also as far as um, somebody had a great uh, suggestion as far as, I think it was the last, uh, last person I was talking, John. Um, he talked about being of service to the uh, to the attorneys. Um, how exactly? What type of services do you provide to those attorneys? As far as you know, uh, I'm I'm an attorney myself, and um, but I don't do probate. But I'm going to. Uh, I want to know what type of services you provide to them so that they can see value in you <laughs> in what we offer. John, can you unmute yourself? I don't want to monopolize that answer when it's directed toward you. Can you hear that? Yep. All right, I got a couple of mics. Um, so first thing I do is just get in front of them, right? You want to get known. And then I start, if you throw stuff at them real quick, they get, anybody gets apprehensive. Like what, what's the kick, what's the kick, what's the catch, right? There is right. no catch for my clients. Um, I offer data death values. I'm a broker. So if you're just an agent, sometimes the attorneys are like, oh, you're an agent, right? But a BPO, a broker price opinion for a oh, data okay. death value, I do data death values for them for their um, stepped up in basis for taxes. Um, some attorneys only want appraisers, which is fine. I have a couple of appraisers I refer them to. They love that. Yeah. Um, and then I will run a CMA at current value. I pull the loans, see what type of loans are on the property. I give them a my best guess of, all right, this loan was put on in 2010. They probably paid off, you know, 10 grand on it. You have about this much in equity. If we were to sell it, um, you can, they can take that to their client. So um, a couple months ago, we went out to the property. We looked at the property. There's no, it was upside down by hundred grand, right? They didn't come to me first. They filed the probate. Everyone was, there's like five kids fighting over it, different administrators, all this stuff. <laughs> They got money sent into this thing because they hired a private fiduciary to be the admin, right? That fiduciary has now got money into this and they're upside down in the house. There's, that's the only ask. There's some cars, some, some collector cars and stuff too, but um, <laughs> how much money is in this property? Why are you even filing a probate if there's right. no equity in this house? Just let it go, get that out of the way. And then you can do an affidavit of probate for the estate afterwards, right? right. So that affidavit is super quick and cheap. Um, I have multiple attorneys ask me that. Should I, should we try to sell it? Just let it go to foreclosure. Then once it goes to foreclosure, technically the bank has to give the beneficiaries the remainder. So let's say I have one right now. It's probably worth 800. They owe four. It's at the brink of foreclosure. If they let it go to foreclosure, the difference might be three, right? Because it's going to be a discount on the foreclosure auction. That gap has to go back to the beneficiary of that note or sorry, the, the maker of the note or the beneficiary of the estate. If it's small enough, you can have to David approve it. So we figure out equity on the estate side. And then um, I start pulling deeds for them and do property history reports. Um, I just become the real estate go-to guy. Mm -hmm. you know how much it's worth. You need to know the equity. You need a deed, uh, title history, all that kind of stuff. If it gets really hairy and you need to really dive into it, then I refer them to my title company. Right. Hey, go buy a title report. It's a uh, mini title reports, 300 bucks. Yeah. Right. If it looks hairy and, and I, and I don't want to put my name behind it. I send them my title. Here's my, and I'll order it for them and pay for it up front. And then I invoice them directly if they don't want to take care of that. Right. Mm -hmm. so, all right. Thank you. A lot of just being that anything you can do to help them out. I'll, I'll go out and secure a property. I'll change locks on properties. I'll do drive-bys, um, whatever you need to do. I'll get tenants out if you need to, all that stuff. So, ah, Okay, perfect. They were going to spend money on a lot of those services anyway. If you throw it in as a, as a loss leader, they will love I mean, that. what's it cost? I got to drive by a property anyway, take a look at it. I go, I give them a value on it. They need me to change a lock. What's a lock? 40 bucks, right? I go secure the property. I throw deadbolts on it for a hundred bucks, right? Yep. My commission is 10 grand on most sales. So uh, <laughs> by the way, US hardware supply, you can get that stuff for like seven. Oh bucks. yeah. Amazon, right. If I have to run down to Home Depot or Lowe's on my way yeah. out, yeah, I'll, I'll grab a lock for 40 bucks. I pre-order them through Amazon usually. Mm -hmm. right, and that's right. valuable because uh, I mean, even in my, my law office, we don't, 
I mean, our paralegals and attorneys, I don't like to go out. We don't like to go anywhere. We're busy in court. Right. But saving us time is like the most important thing you can do for an attorney. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, I mean, I'll go out there. My lock box is 20 bucks. My key, yeah. right? Go rekey it. I carry drills. I drill the lockout, rekey it, throw lock box on there. Yeah. Now everyone has access to it. It, it, I might not get every listing that way, yeah. but I might get the, I'll get the ones that I, right. It, it, yeah, it's a hundred fold up, up front. So yeah, that's gold. Thank you. So there's a lot of stuff that agents can do that. Uh, gosh, I have estate sale people. I'll, I'll meet with admins. They don't, the, the family wants to keep the house, right? Here's the state sale people. Here's this, here's that. But you look like the hero to the attorney, that attorney and the fiduciary. One, one client right now probably sends me six or seven a year at least. Wow. Right. So if you have four or five of those, if you have 10 of those, you're doing 60 deals a year. Easily. Cool. Amazing. So, cool. It's, there's Thanks, not sir. that there are very few agents doing this. Yeah. I'm, I'm in Sacramento area. Just in the Placer County Association of Realtors, there's 4,500 agents on the board. I think Sacramento has 10,000 agents on the board. I'm the only age. There might be one other that shows up here and there. I'm the only one going to the bar, SAC bar meetings, Placer bar meetings, um, the fiduciary meetings. I'm the only one that's there constantly out of what, 15,000 people? Mm -hmm. John, I was about to say that uh, if you're an agent, I guarantee you're not the only one going to the bar. But, uh, uh, but the bar are, you're talking I'm about. I'm at the Sacramento yes. Bar meeting every month, and there might be on, on, consistently, right? Consistently, yeah. <laughs> there might be one other agent showing up every couple months, and that's it. I was referring to the local watering hole, though. <laughs> oh, 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 that bar. Yeah. Oh no, they're right now. Their agents are drinking heavily. I tell you yeah. what. Right, John. Thanks so much. Uh, we do have to kind of put a uh, put a bow on this. Cabby, you good? Anything else? Good. Awesome. Well, we had some people chat and we want to hear from everyone. It's always every single time a little bit of a slow start pulling teeth to get some questions. Um, if you did not get your question answered, you have a win, you have something that you'd like to ask, please come back next week um, and, uh, and, and throw those questions and comments in a little bit sooner so that we don't run out of time on you. But we want to hear from everyone. Um, and I, I, on behalf of the rest of the team i really appreciate you guys being here um jim uh do you want to take us home absolutely i did want to uh before i close i wanted to also Alyssa pointed out that um uh, we started the call about you know the ten thousand contacts what to do right make mistakes john you finished the call with some great ideas what to do with attorneys we have uh, scott who would like to start the next call on what not to do <laughs> yeah he's, he's he's learned he he said i've learned what not to do i'd be glad to share so scott <laughs> please come please come back and we'll start we'll start the next call with that i think between the two of you we really got that attorney uh topic covered so thank you thanks to both of you i want to thank everybody who showed up today great participation particularly thank the great contributions that we had i want to challenge each of you we had some great ideas today take one idea that inspired you on this call, go out and put it into practice. And please come back next Thursday and share the results with the group. Have a great week, everybody. Talk to you same time next Thursday. Take care.